That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, Janice, you, you, you're going to give us our, our intro. People are still logging in. Now, Walter, we need to make a video in Guinea yeah, last week. We didn't upload here. That's why it's not on. Anyway, I'll talk to you afterwards. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of getting out right now. Okay, and I hope I... Sean is okay to have this recorded. Sean, yeah. we've been recording. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay. totally fine. Perfect. Judy, where are the songs? I thought we were going to be hearing beats by uh, Gachoya. Oh, no, 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 no. I know how you shame me with my African music. So <laughs> I, I muted it immediately. You logged on. Sean, Sean can be a witness. But um, so uh, Sean will introduce himself. But Sean would like to work in Africa. And I was telling him how we do work in uh, Tanzania and yeah, yeah, I should have invited you guys. At, you know, my uh, morning was filled with uh, two of these back to back calls, and Victoria will definitely need to connect afterwards. Um, lots and lots of um, lots of work to do. And Sean, you're uh, we're assigning you up for the army, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Perfect, that's funny. Hello, everyone. I see we'll give people like two minutes. Uh, then we'll get started. Anthony, Abarizenu. Yeah, Barienu. I guess my Swahili is getting bad, by the way. But. Go on now. Go on now. To go poor. We are good. Okay, good, good. Karibu. Salim, Thank nice you. to see you again. How are you doing? I am good. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, how about you? I'm good. It's a little cold oh, this morning. Oh, Rather it's raining um, because there's a hurricane close oh, by. So I, mm, but it's okay. Mm. Janet, a bariako? Okay, one more minute. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to play my Kenyan music because Dr. Newsom will shame me. But guys, I need some 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 recommendations. I put Zieke Kwachat. Some nice music. Even if you're studying for the exam, Vana, you've been playing some music. I wanna hear. I'll create a playlist of uh, some least study group. There's a uh, piano. Player. If we don't get suggestions, Dr. Newsom may have to start singing some Bob Marley songs from Jamaica. We, 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 One we, love. Oh, no, 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 please. We do not want to We do not want to get together and feel all right. Okay, guys, please help us, save us from Dr. Newsom. So Anthony says I have jazz on here. Well, Okay, what are you using, Anthony, to create your music? Is it YouTube or Spotify? Or we need, like, I'm going to make a, a playlist. Um, yeah, it's from YouTube. Oh, wow. Okay, put the, put the playlist here so that Dr. Newsom doesn't have to sing to us. Seriously, only Anthony has suggestions. Okay, okay. Okay, fine. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, Walter is at work. You missed him in his very dark blue uh, scrubs. Uh, Dr. Newsom is on. Uh, Dr. Newsom, do you want to say hi? And then we'll introduce our guest. I will introduce our guest. Good morning, everyone. I am excited to be a part of this group again, and I'm just going to mute myself so I can learn everything uh, that I um, opened my mind to learning this morning. Great to see everybody as well. Okay. What's the, the word of the day, Dr. Newsom? The word of the day is uh, still gratitude, and um, that's it. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, as you can see, I'm going, I'm going you, you know, down, allowing you to unmute, to talk, because I thought last time it was very helpful to have that interactive uh, 
nature instead of me reading the questions because I'm actually old. Uh, but just remember, if you're not talking, please mute yourself. Uh, Judy is looking for some music recommendations and uh, unfortunately only Anthony is suggesting them. So maybe I'll have some volunteers through the chat as we go along. And uh, we have a very, very special guest who works with Walter, uh, Dr. Sean. And, you know, I just actually, I've never met Sean before uh, till a few minutes ago. He, I would let him introduce himself. He's in family medicine. He's going to be speaking about endocrine today. And uh, he has a love for Africa. He, in March next year, Walawatuako Eldoret, Irene, he's going to Kapsoa. So we have to give him a, a very good welcome and make sure he enjoys his time in Kenya when he comes over. And uh, hopefully when he decides to settle someplace in Africa, if it turns out to be Kenya, uh, that he will we'll name him and we'll teach him some Swahili as he gives us these lectures. So Karibu everyone and welcome Sean. Hi, yeah, um, good to be here this morning. Thanks guys for coming in. So. Uh, yeah, like she said, my name is Sean. Um, so I'm a pretty informal, uh, so please feel free to interrupt uh, at any time if you have a question. Um, if I didn't explain something well or too fast or if you didn't understand what I said um, or just have a question, feel free to just jump in. Um, so I did put together a PowerPoint um, just for the sake of having kind of images and an easy thing to flow. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and we'll get that going. Okay, can you guys all see this? Yes. Perfect. Okay, one second. Um, no, still, hold on one second. Make that smaller. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to be talking to you guys about endocrine um, topic today. I'm going to, uh, yeah, so there's kind of my credentials um, there. And then, yeah, just a little intro. Um, so family medicine resident, I'm in my second year at Broadlands. Uh, that's where Dr. Mogini is at as well. He's doing psychiatry. Um, so we work alongside each other. I went to medical school here in Des Moines. Um, and yeah, like uh, Judy mentioned, my plan is to move to Africa um, and do medicine among a, a people group um, there that uh, yeah doesn't have access um, that's in need. So that's kind of my goal for the future, so I'm excited to be here talking to you guys today. Um, brief little outline, um, kind of just gonna cover, so the endocrine system is uh, very important to understand, uh, not only for step one, but also just for life um, and for your future work. And so I kind of go over the, the whole thing in just a, an overview. I'll give you some tips on how to study endocrine specifically for your step one exam. Um, and then my target is going to be actually really focusing in on diabetes specifically. There's so many things that we can cover in endocrine. Uh, you guys are going to need more than just one lecture on the endocrine system. And so we'll really dive deep into diabetes. It's very uh, relevant for boards and also for uh, primary care and, and really every, every specialty because patients that have diabetes are, are all over the place and they're, yeah, that disease process affects every area of medicine. Um, and we'll have some open time for questions. As we go through, there'll also be some things that I kind of highlight that are just uh, tips for actual medical practice, um, but may not be what you should say for your answer for boards. I'll be sure to be very clear and distinguish those things when I do, but just so that you guys have a little clinical knowledge added in with this too. So with that, um, we'll dive in. So this definition on endocrinology is from the USMLE First Aid book, 2020. And so I'll just read this. Uh, the endocrine system comprises widely distributed organs that work in a highly integrated manner to orchestrate a state of hormonal equilibrium within the body. Generally speaking, endocrine diseases can be classified either as diseases of underproduction or overproduction, or as conditions involving the development of mass lesions, which themselves may be associated with underproduction or overproduction of hormones. Therefore, the study of the endocrine system is first by learning the glands, their hormones, and their regulation, and then by integrating disease manifestations with diagnosis and management take time to learn the multi-system connections. I think that's a really good definition, but it's also uh, a lot. So um, to simplify it, uh, basically the endocrine system, it's just a bunch of different organs throughout your body that try to help manage your normal body function. Um, 
more than more often than not the function of one organ will depend on the function of another so if one organ is affected then it's going to also affect all of the other organs that it normally is working alongside and so it creates this big you know kind of uh, down trickle of, of effects um, so when you're studying endocrine for your board exam you need to know the different pathways of the hormones you need to know where the hormones come from uh, where the hormones go and then what uh, those hormones cause to happen, and then what that does throughout the whole body. The nice thing about endocrine is that if you can just memorize all of these different hormone pathways, uh, and you have that you know, just memorized in your mind, then when you get a question on boards, you don't need to necessarily have memorized the specific disease question, um, but instead you can just critically think through based on what you remember from the pathways. Um, and so that'll help you problem solve your endocrine questions. So really take time to make sure that you kind of write out these pathways. Um, there are a lot of organs that the endocrine system involves, but the three primary ones from the endocrine system that you need to know really well are the pituitary gland, there's an anterior and a posterior lobe, uh, the thyroid gland, and then the adrenal gland, there's a cortex and a medulla um, that all have different functions. Um, this lecture is not going to dive too deep into that anatomy, uh, maybe a future lecture, uh, but you definitely want to know those three organs inside and out. Um, and then, yeah, just like I said before, make sure that you know all the different hormones that are made, um, what effect they have. And then there's usually a positive or a negative feedback loop with each hormone. And so what that means is uh, some, you know, hormones, they're going to be positively uh, impacted by one thing that's downstream. So something that's later in the system is going to make the body make more of that hormone. And then there's also usually something that will uh, trigger the body to stop making certain hormones. And that's the negative feedback loop. So you want to make sure you understand those as well. Um, one tip for how to keep everything organized is uh, you can draw out a flow chart for each of the major organs, um, their hormones and the effects of all those little flow um, or like all those different pathways. You draw out a flow chart for each one. And then that's what I would study off of um, so that you can have kind of that problems solving um, kind of basis with the pathway. So this is, that's a lot of words um, uh, just as an introduction, but let me give you something that's a little bit more tangible so that you can um, kind of see what I'm talking about. So this is just an example. This isn't what we're going to be talking about today, but I just think this is a helpful way that you can study for your board exam. So this flow chart that's been drawn out, you have the hypothalamus at the top, which is the first organ, and it produces a hormone called thyroid releasing hormone. And that stimulates the anterior pituitary to release something called thyroid stimulating hormone, which then stimulates the thyroid gland to release T4 or free T4. Um, and then when the T4 gets to the target tissues, uh, a reaction occurs that then turns it into T3 and then T3 goes back and has an effect on those tissues, but then it also goes back up to the anterior pituitary and it tells the anterior pituitary to stop making TSH. Um, so that's a lot. If you haven't really studied this before, that might be really overwhelming, but this is the kind of thing that you want to have memorized. Just the back of your mind, you know this pathway like the back of your hand, so that when you get a thyroid question on boards, you can quickly refer back to this pathway um, and it will help you to answer whatever question that you run into. So let's put it in practice. Here's a sample question about thyroid hormone. So you have a 32-year-old obese female who presents to your clinic with complaints of fatigue, feeling cold all the time, and constipation. She states that these things have been present for a long time and have been getting progressively worse over the past few months. You obtained some lab studies, which are shown below. So a hemoglobin of 13.5, sodium of 134, potassium of 3.7, and a TSH of 9.3. Um, so can anyone tell me if any of these lab values are abnormal? And if so, how are they abnormal? Okay, Tim. So, okay. So, um, Sean, I don't know if you're able to see the chat, uh, but you know, there are usually some responses. So TSH is high. Um, but guys also feel just to unmute and just speak. As long as you're not off speaking at the same time, it's fine. Great. Uh, yeah, perfect. That's helpful. I can't see the chat, um, but yeah. So TSH is high. Good. Uh, the other three are all normal. Uh, your TSH is high. It should be between 0.4 and 4.0. Um, so this is really common on boards. They'll give you a question, and then they'll give you a bunch of lab values, and most of them will be totally normal. 
Um, and so you kind of want to have a, a general idea of the common lab uh, ranges so that you can identify what's wrong. Because otherwise you might think, oh wait, maybe that potassium is low. I don't remember what the normal range is. And then you kind of go down a, a rabbit hole that you don't want to. So just kind of have those things in mind. But boards will often give you a lot more information than what you actually need. So just be aware of that. Try to zoom in on the things that are actually relevant. Do okay, so comment that sodium is low? I think because most people are like at 135 to 145. Yeah, I guess, yeah, technically by that, some of the um, lab uh, reportings will actually do 132 up to 145, and that's what my lab uses um, as a range. Anything above 130 is probably fine, uh, but that's good that you noted that. Um, it just kind of depends on the, the lab that you're working with, but yeah, I think maybe textbook is 135 to 145, so good. Yeah, that's Hello. Good. Yes, John. Let's go on. Okay. Um, all right. So why is her TSH high? Just looking at this uh, diagram here, who can tell me why her TSH is elevated or what might cause her TSH to be elevated? Uh, Banat, do you want to just speak? Because there's no feedback. Yeah, no feedback. Perfect. So the most common cause of this is going to be that your T3 is low. So your T3 tells the anterior pituitary not to make TSH. If your T3 is low, you don't have enough of that feedback. And so then the TSH is gonna be driven upward in an attempt to, to fix that problem. So it's not, it doesn't matter that her TSH is high. That doesn't cause any bad problems in the body. But what it tells you is that she doesn't have enough T3. Um, and that can explain all of her other symptoms. Um, so based on all of that, what, uh, which of these medicines are you gonna give this patient? Uh, ferrous sulfate, um, cyanocobalamin, uh, metoclopramide, or levothyroxine? The what was that? Levothyroxine. Perfect. Yep, that's what you're going to give. Something else to note about these questions too. So if you thought the hemoglobin was low, then ferrous sulfate would be a treatment for that. So it's related to the labs that you're given. Uh, the fact that she's been tired, cyanocobalamin can help with energy levels. The fact that she's constipated, metoclopramide can help with increasing uh, gastric motility. So the answers that you get on boards, they're always going to be related to the, the things that you have in the question. So again, you're going to see a lot of things that you think, oh, that would help. Oh, that would help. Oh, that would help. Um, but just make sure that you're zooming in on the most important thing. So for her, her symptoms are due to her low thyroid. So she needs thyroid supplementation. So low thyroxin. Good. Okay. So that's just a kind of general intro into endocrine and how I recommend you guys study for endocrine. Um, but let's dive deeper into specifically diabetes. Uh, again, very board relevant and very clinically relevant. And so we'll work through a couple of different things. Okay, so this is insulin. Um, this is the hormone that your endocrine system uses in order to manage glucose in your body. Um, and so the way that insulin is produced is that the beta islet cells of your pancreas, they make something called pre-pro-insulin. Uh, that will get cleaved by a process that you don't necessarily need to know for boards, um, but it produces what's called pro-insulin. And this is what is stored in your pancreatic secretory granules. Um, then once that, uh, and that's what's in this top right picture is the pro-insulin. So you can see the C-peptide, the alpha chain, and then the beta chain. Um, so once that gets cleaved, the way that it gets cleaved is the C-peptide gets cleaved off of the rest of it. And then that leaves you with insulin and then C-peptide. And then that's what actually will get released from the pancreatic cells by a process that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, something about C-peptide that I just want to note, um, C-peptide is only found in endogenous insulin. So insulin that your body itself has made um, is the only time that you'll have C-peptide uh, as, like, as part of the process. So exogenously administered insulin that you give to yourself uh, through syringe, that does not have C-peptide in it. So a very popular board question that you might see uh, will involve a nurse who's uh, trying to kill herself, actually trying to commit suicide. That's a common board question. And the way that she'll do it is she'll administer insulin to herself to drop her sugar levels so low um, in that attempt. So the information that the question will give you is that it will tell you that her insulin levels are elevated, that her glucose levels are really low, and it will say that she doesn't have a detectable C-peptide level. Um, and so just when you see that type of thing, remember that, oh, that means that she gave herself insulin externally. It wasn't from inside. 
Um, but if someone's C-peptide is elevated, then that means that it's from insulin that's being made by the body. So you would see that in something called an insulinoma, which is a tumor of the pancreas that produces extra insulin, so more insulin than what you need. And that's going to give you a lot of extra C-peptide. And then also there's a drug class called sulfonylureas. Um, we're going to discuss that a little later, but sulfonylureas actually can increase both your insulin and C-peptide levels as well. Um, so just try to keep that in mind. Your C-peptide can give you an idea if it was insulin made by the body or insulin given from outside the body. Um, okay, so there's a number of uh, glucose transporters that exist in the body. Um, and so we'll talk about those. These are important. Um, so the one that is insulin dependent, which means that uh, in order for it to operate, it has to have insulin on board, is the GLUT4. So the GLUT4. This is found on your adipose or your fat tissue. And it's also found on striated muscles, so your skeletal muscle, your big muscle groups. Um, and then exercise can actually increase the production of these transporters as well. Um, so people who are exercising a lot, uh, they will make more of this transporter on their muscles, uh, which is really important because the muscles need glucose in order to function. Um, so if you're working out a bunch, you need extra glucose to the muscles in order for them to, to produce the energy that they need. So the insulin will actually bind to a tyrosine kinase receptor on the GLUT4 transporter. And that will trigger an internal cellular cascade that, oh, I'm sorry, it's a tyro tyrosine kinase receptor that's just on the cell. Um, and then that triggers a cellular cascade, which causes GLUT4 to be made and then put on the outside of the cell. So insulin binds to a receptor, which triggers the production of GLUT4, um, which is a glucose transporter. Now, all these other ones, they do not require insulin. So your body will utilize these transporters without any insulin on board. Um, so GLUT1 is for red blood cells, brain, cornea, placenta. Your GLUT2 is for the beta islet cells, liver, kidney, and your GI tract. And you want to think two directional. So this type of transporter, it transports glucose both directions. So it's not just one way, but it's two ways um, in all of these places. Everywhere else is just one way. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, GLUT3 is for brain placenta. GLUT5 is for sperm and also for your GI tract. But this one is specific for fructose. Uh, rather than glucose, and so a sugar transporter, but it's fructose instead. And then there are some receptors called the SGLT1 and 2 uh, transporters. These are actually found in your kidney and your small intestine, and they're a glucose and sodium co-transporter. So they transport both glucose and sodium across together. Um, and this is important because of a medicine that we're going to talk about that uses uh, this channel to help with diabetes management. A mnemonic that can help you uh, is now up in the right corner. Uh, called brick lips. So this just reminds you of what all of the insulin independent transporters are. So brain, red blood cells, intestine, cornea, kidney, liver, islet cells, uh, placenta, and spermatocytes. So brick lips. So you can try to keep that in mind. I like mnemonics. They help me to remember things um, even in clinic. So um, okay, I have a diagram for those in a minute. Um, so that'll be easier to look through. Um, so insulin regulation, glucose is your primary regulator of insulin. So just kind of like how we talked about how T3 has a negative feedback against TSH, glucose has a positive feedback for insulin. So when you have extra glucose in your body, it triggers your body to produce more insulin. So what glucose does is it crosses those GLUT2 receptors, um, which are insulin independent, so you don't need insulin for that, but they cross the GLUT2 receptors to get into the beta uh, islet cells of the pancreas that triggers a cellular cascade that then results in release of insulin into your blood from the pancreas. Um, another thing is that after you eat anything, the stretching from your stomach actually triggers uh, the production of something called glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, or GIP. And GIP, it actually increases the beta islet cell sensitivity to glucose. So you eat something, you release this polypeptide, it makes the beta islet cells more uh, receptive to glucose, and then the glucose goes in, and then it triggers the insulin production. So this is how our body makes insulin. It's triggered by the glucose. Here are some diagrams, a little more helpful uh, to look at um, than my words, but yeah, so if you look at the left image, this is the insulin-dependent uh, GLUT4 transporter that's found. Um, on the cells of the muscles and the adipose tissue that we talked about. So you can see the insulin will bind to that tyrosine kinase receptor at the top, that's the orange cluster, um, that's step one. That triggers a phosphorylation event that will trigger a RASMAP kinase pathway, um, which helps for cell growth and DNA synthesis. So another thing to know is that insulin is a growth factor. 
So when insulin binds to cells, it also causes cells to grow completely independent of any glucose. That's just a separate thing that's happening. Um, so keep that in mind, insulin is a growth factor. Um, but then the other thing that it does is it triggers this phosphoenacetide uh, three kinase pathway. And what that does is it triggers the production and the release of GLUT4 and then puts that out onto the cells so that glucose can come into those cells. So this is how the insulin dependent glucose pathway happens. If you don't have any insulin, you won't make these GLUT4 transporters and then glucose cannot get into these cells. It's really key um, for our muscle health, um, which is obviously important for everything else that we do. Okay. Uh, the other side on the right side is um, insulin secretion by the pancreatic beta cell. So this is the actual production of insulin itself. So you see on the left of that little cell, there's the GLUT2 transporter. So glucose comes in. It doesn't need any insulin to do this. It's insulin independent. So the glucose comes in. Um, it undergoes glycolysis, um, and that gives you uh, increased ATP. Um, the ATP will actually bind to these uh, calcium, or these uh, potassium channels, um, and it will cause the potassium channels to close. So then, when the potassium channels close, the potassium stays inside the cell, and then that causes a depolarization event. When the cell depolarizes, it opens the voltage-gated calcium channels that you see on the right side of the cell, and that opens and then triggers a bunch of calcium to come in. When the calcium comes in, that triggers the uh, exocytosis of the insulin granules and release of insulin into the blood. So this is the pathway for how insulin production works. Uh, does anyone have any questions at this point? I know I've talked about a lot of things so far. I don't see any questions on the chat, uh, but also people are free to mute themselves. I just put some messages there in the chat that this is super high yield because when you have hyperkalemia, right, high potassium, we use glucose and insulin, right, because of these uh, pathways, you know, so, and uh, yeah, okay. I don't see a question. Okay, I'll just keep going then. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I said feel free to just jump in, um, interrupt me. Uh, so uh, of note, the sulfonylurea, that's the drug class that I was talking about that can cause increased insulin in C peptide. The way that it works is it uh, works here at this calcium or at this potassium channel. Um, it externally causes that to close. And so that helps to increase that depolarization event, which then increases your insulin production. Um, so I just wanted to point that out since I had this image up, but we'll talk more about the drugs in a little bit. Okay, so I have a case and some questions associated. So we have a patient who is an obese 53-year-old male who comes into the clinic with complaint of increased urination during the day and night, worsening vision, and then a pins and needles sensation in his feet that begins to burn when he walks for more than an hour. The patient never goes to the doctor. His last checkup was a pre-employment physical at 18 years of age. So what is the most likely diagnosis? Um, before we do that, actually, though, let me ask, can someone or people uh, just kind of chime in and what are some pertinent things in this question stem? What are some things that uh, trigger like a red flag to you um, that help you decide on your answer? You can just shout them out or put them in the chat. On zero, you said E. Uh, could you explain your thought process, right? So remember, guys, also, we're trying to improve gamesmanship, how to, when you're tired, doing 350 questions, how do you, um, you know, navigate and make sure that you're on the correct path? Manjiro? Or Pauline? Or Nanyu? Um, so, um, okay, I think there are two questions. One, the key things that stand out on the, on the stem of the question. One is, uh, he's 53, he's obese, and then we see um, he seems to have uh, polyuria, we have pins and needles, that sounds uh, a neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, and uh, my most likely diagnosis I would think of diabetes mellitus too. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So those are a lot of the same things that I highlighted um, as well. So yeah, obesity, uh, polyuria, uh, worsening vision, the neuropathy. 
Um, so those are all buzzwords that you want to look for in your question stem that will push you towards uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. Good. That's perfect. Um, yeah. So let's talk about how someone develops diabetes um, a little bit more. So the result of diabetes 2 is significantly elevated blood glucose levels over a long period of time. So if you remember how a feedback loop works, um, the glucose levels are stimulating the insulin production. But if you have so much glucose over such a long period of time, then that's going to continue to stimulate over and over and over again for a long period of time. And eventually the body will stop responding. It'll burn out. Um, and so if you guys remember those GLUT4 transporters um, on the beta islet cells, the insulin independent ones. So then you just get so much insulin released into the body that eventually your body just gets overwhelmed is the easiest way to think about it. Um, but so that feedback loop gets over overwhelmed. Um, and then insulin will overstimulate those tyrosine kinase receptors. Um, and then eventually those will burn out. And then so the body will not express as many of the GLUT4 transporters, which is the insulin dependent uh, glucose uptake. So now you have so much glucose and so much insulin in the body that the body is not responding to it anymore. Um, and so then your body can't take up all that extra glucose. So the extra glucose stays in your blood because you can't take it up into the cells that actually need it. Um, so that's what causes diabetes. This is why, um, you know, like obesity is a big piece of that because if people are obese, a lot of that reason is because they're overeating, they're eating unhealthy foods, um, and they're not exercising. So it kind of creates that cascade. They have a lot of extra glucose going into the body. They're not using it up as much because they're not exercising. Exercise also increases that GLUT4 transporter. So if they're not doing that, then that's also decreased. And then so you just end up with this huge level of glucose, huge level of insulin, and then no response to it. So eventually, what that progresses to is it causes an insulin insensitivity. So that is what diabetes effectively is, is it's an insensitivity to insulin. So you're not responding to it anymore. Um, and so that, that just makes your blood glucose levels worse. So here are some symptoms and complications that you get from diabetes. So you get polydipsia and polyuria. The reason for this is because glucose is an osmotic uh, agent. It's a pro-osmotic agent. So wherever glucose goes, water is going to follow with it. So it will diffuse across membranes with the glucose um, as it is more saturated. So when you have a lot of extra glucose, your kidneys kick up um, uh, and they work harder to excrete more and more and more of that glucose through the proximal convoluted tubule. And when it does that, it's also gonna pull water with it and you'll excrete excess water as well. So that'll give you the polyuria. So that's, you have these people that say, man, I've just been peeing like eight times a day and I used to only pee like twice a day and I don't know what's going on. Um, it's because all that extra glucose is pulling all of that extra water into the kidneys. And then because of that, they get dehydrated, which then causes the polydipsia. So then they're really thirsty all day long. And they're constantly drinking water, but then they're constantly peeing and they don't know why that's happening. So that's the reason for that. Uh, you also get significant vascular disease from diabetes. So uh, the blood vessels can uh, actually, the sugars will stick to it through a process called glycosylation. Um, and so the sugar will stick to the inside of the blood vessel linings. And that causes a basement membrane thickening um, of those blood vessels. Uh, and then that will cause them to swell. And then they uh, can actually get other things that will uh, stick on to where those things have glycosylated in the blood vessels. So that can give you atherosclerotic plaques. Um, and give you uh, artery narrowing, um, all kinds of things like that. And that'll cause injury to those blood vessels. So if you have little small vessels that go to the eyes and to your kidneys, um, and then those things get clogged up from all the extra sugar, then that's gonna cause injury to those tissues because now they're not getting as much blood flow. And that will promote your retinopathy, which will worsen your vision. People will complain of you know, not being able to see as well as they used to be able to. And it also gives you a nephropathy, so it causes damage to those kidneys because they're not getting their full blood supply. Um, it can also cause injury to the larger blood vessels in the same way. Um, that will give you peripheral vascular disease, so just injury to the, the vessels of the periphery in general, um, and that can cause a cascade of issues. It can also contribute to coronary artery disease, um, which can make you more likely to get an MI, and it can also damage the blood vessels in the brain, which makes it more likely for you to have a stroke and things like that. So you can see there's a lot of complications that come from having diabetes, and it's just all due to the extra sugars that are circulating. Uh, so with nephropathy, the extra glucose that's going across the glomeruli will cause injury because now there's more pressure going through the kidney than what should be um, or what normally would be. 
and that can cause a progressive proteinuria. So you get injury to those glomeruli, those uh, glomeruli, they get bigger and wider from the injury, and then now you have proteins spilling out of the, the kidneys, and so you get a, a progressive proteinuria. Um, and then the neuropathy and the retinopathy, the pathophys behind this, I think, is actually kind of interesting. So glucose can trans, uh, it can um, transfuse across the membrane to get into uh, nerve tissue, as well as into the, uh, the cells of the eyes and of the retina. Um, but usually uh, glucose doesn't transfer across those membranes uh, very often. Um, it's not common that it will do that. Uh, but when you have a really high level of glucose in the blood, because there's so much of it, more and more of it will go across those membranes and get into those nerve cells and into those eye cells. Um, when that happens, there's actually a, an enzyme inside the eye cells and inside the nerve cells called, uh, it's a, like a D, I don't actually remember the name of it, but it converts the glucose into sorbitol. I'll need to look that up, sorry, but it converts it to sorbitol. And the sorbitol, it actually can't get out of those tissues. So the glucose goes in, gets converted into sorbitol, and then it can't come out, but it brings water in with it. So it causes swelling, and that will cause damage to the nerves and damage to the eyes, and it also promotes cataract production as well. So people will get this progressively worsening uh, vision because they have swelling in their retina, which causes damage from the sorbitol, cataract development from the increased protein within the eye, and then uh, the neuropathy is caused by the nerve damage from uh, all of the swelling to those nerve cells. So that's kind of the path of this behind uh, all these different things um, that happen from diabetes. Um, okay. Before we go to, as people yeah. read that question, uh, there's a question here, what's the pathophysiology of the cosmal ketotic breath? Oh yeah, like of the fruity breath. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about that actually when we get to DKA. So I'll okay. wait. Uh, I have a slide on that. So we'll and then on. there's a question, uh, uh, probably even best, but, but it's uh, what's the pathophysiology behind gangrene foot and poor wound healing? Oh yeah, good. So um, yep. So the vascular injury that uh, gets caused by the blood sugars uh, glycosylating to the inner lining of the vessel. It causes injury to those vessels and causes them to swell, like I talked about. And so then blood isn't able to get to the tissues uh, completely. And so uh, blood is the healing agent of the body. So in order for a wound to heal, it requires adequate blood supply. Um, but these uh, vessels in a diabetic are injured because of all the blood sugar. And so they can't get adequate blood supply to a wound. Um, that's especially true of the lower extremities, um, so the legs. Uh, and the reason for that also is because not only are you're getting less blood supply, but you're also, your blood is also working against gravity to come back up to the heart. And so you have um, like increased swelling from uh, the blood. It's, it's not getting to where it needs to go and then it can't come back up from where it needs to be. So you're not getting those restorative, you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide um, exchanges. And so the blood's not able to work as effectively in those tissues. So the wounds will just, take a long time to heal because they're not getting adequate blood supply. And the longer a wound sits in a place, the more likely it is to become infected, um, either by normal skin bacteria or by something that you get exposed to in the environment. And so diabetics, they have delayed wound healing because of their decreased blood supply. And then the, because they have more wounds, um, then those wounds have a higher likelihood of getting infected. Um, and then because of the, nephro or the neuropathy, they can't always feel. Um, everything as well. So the nerves are dying, especially in the peripheral, because that's where the blood vessels are the smallest. So that's where the most decrease in the blood supply will be. So those nerves die out. And then so people can have a wound on the bottom of their foot, and then they have no idea that it's there because they can't feel the bottom of their foot at all. All the sensation is gone. Um, and so they can get pressure ulcers on the bottom of their feet, or they can like step on a nail and not even know that they did, and then just keep going. Um, and then it's not healing, and then it gets infected. Um, and that's why it's really important that you educate your diabetics to look at their feet or have their partner look at their feet. Um, and it's important that you do a foot exam every single time a diabetic comes into your office because you want to make sure that you catch if there's a wound that they just are completely unaware of um, that's kind of festering. So yeah, great question. Okay, so back to our case, same, same uh, question. Uh, so you suspect type 2 diabetes, as we already talked about. So what should the testing be that you next perform for your diagnosis? Should you get a hemoglobin and hematocrit? Should you get a random blood glucose? Should you do a three-hour blood glucose tolerance test? 
Should you get a fasting glucose level another day? Or should you do an insulin sensitivity assay? So yeah, we have a couple awesome. of answers here. Okay. Yeah. Random blood sugar, fasting blood sugar, um, B for dog, C for cat, B, two Bs for boys. Uh, could we have uh, Charles Mundia? Do you want to tell us why you chose uh, B? Um, because it's the first time he's presenting and uh, he's not had a checkup, I think, since age 18. So I'd prefer to start there. And then once I have any other indicators, I can escalate to the two hour glucose tolerance test and the HbA1c. So yeah, that was great. Um, that answer was, uh, was exactly what I was looking for. One thing to note, so you mentioned the two hour glucose tolerance test. You're right, that is the correct test, but you'll note that this question has three hour glucose tolerance test. Um, which there is a three hour glucose tolerance test, but it's specific to gestational diabetes. So for pregnant women only. So again, you just wanna be really clear as you're reading through the answers um, that you are making sure that you, you know, if you just were to read, uh, you know, our glucose tolerance test, you might think, oh yeah, that's an option. But remember it's the two hour um, for diabetes mellitus two. And so just make sure that you really um, look closely at the answer questions um, for your test. Uh, yeah, so these are the three options for how you can diagnose diabetes mellitus 2. Um, you can get a fasting blood glucose level. Uh, so the patient has to have been fasting for at least eight hours. And then if the blood uh, glucose is greater than 126, then that is diagnostic. Uh, you can do a two-hour glucose tolerance test. So this is where you give your patient a 75-gram glucose solution. And then two hours later, you check their uh, glucose level. And if it's greater than 200, then that's diagnostic. And then the uh, gold standard test is the hemoglobin A1C. Uh, so this is an average of your blood sugar levels over the last three months. Uh, the reason for that is because, uh, like I talked about, how blood glucose will glycosylate the inside of blood vessels. It'll also glycosylate red blood cells. Um, and red blood cells have about a three-month uh, lifespan, so the last about 90 to 120 days. So uh, the hemoglobin A1C, all it's measuring is it's measuring how much glucose is uh, glycosylated onto red blood cells. And since red blood cells last for about three months, it gives you an average of their blood sugars over the last three months. So a normal level for that is less than 4.7. Um, if it's between 4.7 and 6.4, then we call that pre-diabetes. And then if it's 6.5 or higher, then that is a diagnosis for diabetes mellitus too. So these are the three options that you'll see on your board exam. So make sure you have those numbers memorized um, for all of those different options. Um, okay, so- um, There's a question, okay. is the random blood uh, glucose diagnostic? So you cannot use the random blood sugar as a diagnostic for diabetes too. And the reason is because you don't know uh, what your patient has eaten or when or how much sugar was in it or any of those things. So there's just too many question marks about just a random uh, blood sugar. And so to be diagnostic, uh, you have to do this two hour glucose where you know I gave them 75 grams of glucose and then two hours later I checked their blood sugar and then this is what it was. Um, historically, we have said that a random blood glucose of greater than 200 is diagnostic, uh, but we no longer use that metric for diagnosis. But I mean, if you see a random blood sugar of greater than 200, you should be very suspicious that the person has diabetes. But for test taking purposes, uh, it's got to be one of these three. So just make sure that you know those three. But good question. Um, okay, so what is your first line treatment option uh, for this patient who you've now diagnosed with type 2 diabetes? Is it metformin, uh, lifestyle modifications, insulin, sopospravir, or gabapentin? We have a C and a B. 
Uh, so waiting for some more answers. A couple of boys. Uh, many people voted B. Does anyone want to explain their rationale? Maybe we start with the person who said A. Joy, do you want to tell us why uh, the first line is A and then we can have someone who said B? Um, I don't know if you can hear me, but yeah. I thought the first line was A because um, this patient is already symptomatic. He has worsening vision, you know, he already has the polyuria, he already has the peripheral neuropathy. So I think it would be, in my opinion, yeah, make, make more sense to start him on metformin. Okay. Uh, someone from the B team. You know I'm going to call on you. Akshay. Okay. Uh, she Why well, said... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I said B is most like same as hypertension, always the first line. You always have to do a lifestyle modification. Then we start drugs. So that's why I went for lifestyle modification as our first line. Yep. Yeah, so that's correct. Um, for boards in particular, this will always be the first thing that you want to emphasize. Um, I'm going to be honest. I mean, this isn't exactly what we do in actual clinical practice. Um, I would start this patient on metformin. Um, as well, but I just want to highlight on the boards, make sure that you always choose prevention as the first line, because that's what they're always going to push for is for prevention. Um, and then just to like know, yeah, if a patient loses weight, if they stop eating so much processed sugars, if they increase their exercise, they can really reverse the effects of diabetes um, and they can prevent going into a chronic state of the disease. I've seen people actually who came in and their A1C was 9.6. Um, and then they didn't want to go on medicines. And so they said they were just going to change their diet and start exercising. And I, you know, I can't force someone to take medicine. So I said, okay. Um, and then they came back in their uh, A1C at the next check three months later was 4.3. Um, and then they didn't have any more issues after that. So people really can reverse this process, even if they have fairly extensive disease. Um, and so you always at least want to talk to your patients about these lifestyle modifications. Um, even if you're going to start them on medication, that's fine. But just make sure you don't leave this out of your treatment plan because it's really very important. Um, and I also just say this is just, again, a clinical practice note, not necessarily for boards. Uh, but if someone's A1C is greater than 10, that is indication to immediately start insulin therapy. Um, and so you just you bypass, uh, you know, any of the other meds and you just jump straight to insulin uh, to try to get that level lower. Um, but again, lifestyle changes are always going to be relevant to your discussion. Um, and so you want to make sure that you include those conversations with your patients. But um, as uh, the first uh, person who was speaking from the last time, uh, metformin is the first line uh, for diabetes. Um, so good job on that for medications. Um, it is the first line uh, drug treatment option um, beyond the lifestyle modifications. And you're almost always going to have your patients on metformin unless there's a reason not to put them on metformin, uh, even if you're doing something else. And so if you, if you start insulin on a patient, you'll also probably start them on metformin just based on how it works. And so now we're going to talk about all the drugs. Uh, this is a little bit overwhelming, but it's super important and you'll need to know it for boards. Uh, so these are things that you want to make sure you know. Uh, so the first class, the first two classes of drugs, the way that they work is they increase insulin sensitivity. So this is going to, uh, these drugs are going to make your body more receptive to insulin. So the first class is called the biguanides. Uh, metformin is this drug. So again, this is that first line drug of choice that we were talking about. Uh, it inhibits something called MGD, MGPD, um, and that stops gluconeogenesis. And so this it actually inhibits your body from making more sugar. Um, because you already have enough on board. Um, and then it also increases glycolysis, so breakdown of sugar, and then your peripheral glucose uptake. So it stimulates those cells to be more ready to receive insulin. So remember that diabetes is a process of insulin insensitivity. So the body is becoming less sensitive to insulin. So metformin tries to reverse that by making the body more sensitive to insulin and making less of the sugar. Most common side effects for this are GI upset. Diarrhea is really common in metformin. So you always want to start your patients on a low dose and then slowly titrate up. It can also give you a lactic acidosis. It's usually not an extreme lactic acidosis, but it can give you a mild 
lactic acidosis. And if you have a patient that's on metformin and they come in and they're septic from an infection and have an elevated lactic acid, then you want to hold their metformin so it doesn't make it worse. Um, it can also cause weight loss. And so your patients will usually like that. Um, and so a, a helpful benefit for your diabetics who could probably use uh, some help with weight loss is metformin will give that too. There's also a drug called glitazones. They all contain, contain glit. So I didn't list them out because I don't want you to try to remember every single little drug name. I just want you to remember what is in the name of the drug. So then when you see any drug that is this class, you'll be able to recognize it. So it's got glit in it somewhere. So all the drugs will say something glit. Um, this activates something called PPAR gamma and that increases insulin sensitivity in the body as well. Um, so that's how that works. Side effects for this one, it actually causes weight gain. So it has the opposite effects. And the reason for that is actually because it causes uh, fluid retention um, by the way that it works uh, on the kidney. So you can get edema and it can also worsen heart failure. So you never want to give this drug to a patient that has heart failure. Um, so just make sure you know that. So that's uh, one way to treat. There's a okay. question. Uh, yep. Glitazones are the same as TZDs? Are the same as what? TZD. Oh, yes, the thio, um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember. The, yeah, the TZDs, yep, same class, exactly, yep. Um, so TZDs, they're the glit drugs, good job. Um, okay, another way that you can target diabetes for treatment is to increase the insulin secretion, so how much your body is actually making. So uh, two drugs for this are the sulfonylureas and the megalitinides. Uh, so sulfonylureas have two generations, the first and second generation drugs. Um, the first generation are the clopropramide and the tolbutamide. Uh, we don't use these drugs anymore because they can give patients a disulfiram-like reaction, um, similar to like metronidazole uh, mixed with alcohol. Um, it, gives, it can give them a similar reaction. So we never, I've never used this before. Um, but the second generation drugs are the glibiride and glipizide. Um, and I use these drugs all the time. So these are very commonly used. Um, and then there's another class called the meglitinides, and they all contain uh, GLIN. So G-L-I-N -L will be in the drug name somewhere. So does anyone remember the, I talked about the, the mechanism of action of the sulfonylurea before on that diagram. Does anyone remember what the mechanism of action is for the sulfonylureas? Mm -hmm. okay. They close the potassium channel. Yep, perfect. So this right here. Yep, binds to the potassium channel, uh, causes the cells to depolarize, which then stimulates more release of insulin. So that's how uh, those drugs work. So it makes more insulin in the body. Good. Um, side effects for these drugs is they can cause weight gain and hypoglycemia. So these are one of the drugs. Um, technically, metformin can give... Uh, hypoglycemia as well, but it's not very common and it's not very significant. Um, but sulfonylureas in particular, they can give people some pretty significant hypoglycemia because it increases the amount of insulin that's being produced. So you just want to make sure that you educate your patients on uh, what the signs and symptoms of a low blood sugar are and that they have appropriate uh, medications or even just, um, you know, candy on them at all times so that they can increase their sugar levels if they need to. Um, okay, there's another couple of classes that decrease your glucose absorption. So these actually work in the gut. Um, and so the sodium glucose co-transporter 2, which is that SGLT2 uh, that we talked about earlier, um, uh, all of these drugs contain GLIF in them, so glyph somewhere in the name. Uh, these block the resorption of glucose from your proximal convoluted tubule in the renal nephron. And so if you remember from renal, uh, you know, a bunch of solutes and um, uh, get dumped into the nephron to be processed. And then at the beginning, in the proximal convoluted tubule, there's all these different channels that help to reabsorb uh, glucose and amino acids and protein and just different things that your body wants to kind of reserve. So the SGLT2 inhibitors, what they do is they block the glucose uh, resorbing um, channel. So instead of bringing the glucose back into the body, you pee out all of that extra glucose. And so you don't keep any or as much behind from the kidney. So the side effects of this is that you get a bunch of glucose in your urine. And so this increases the amount of glucose you have in your urine and that will feed bacteria. So it's common for people to get UTI 
for women to get vaginal candidiasis while they're on this medication. So you just want to make sure you educate your patients on that. It can also cause dehydration because again, remember that water follows glucose. So if you're keeping all of that extra glucose in the kidney, then you're also going to keep all of that extra water in the kidney. And so you can get dehydration. People can get orthostatic hypotension. So when they stand up, their blood pressure to their brain drops and they get really dizzy and they might pass out. Um, so you want to keep that in mind. It can cause hyperkalemia. Um, I, and I don't exactly remember the mechanism behind that, but it's something to do with how glucose and potassium are e exchanged in the kidney um, later. So it, it causes your body to reserve more potassium. Um, and then this can also cause weight loss. Uh, and then another class of drug is the alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Uh, they're called acarbose and miglitol. So those are the two drug names. Um, and basically what this does is it inhibits an enzyme that's in your gut that's responsible to break down carbohydrates into simple carbohydrates that can be absorbed. So it prevents your body from absorbing sugar and it stays inside the gut. Um, so what that can do is it can cause GI upset and bloating because again, water follows sugar. So if the sugar doesn't go into the body and stays in the intestines, then it's gonna pull water into the intestines. And so you'll get bloating, um, diarrhea, and those kinds of things. So that's another mechanism. Uh, a fourth mechanism is increasing your glucose-induced insulin secretion. Um, so these drugs are becoming very popular um, more recently, um, and they're also very expensive, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but the GLP-1 analogs, so exenatide and liraglutide, um, basically what this does is it, um, it stimulates um, Sorry, uh, it's, it's, it works similarly to GLP-1 in your body, and that decreases glucagon release. Um, it also decreases gastric emptying, and it increases your glucose-dependent insulin release. So those GLUT4 transporters uh, that are your glucose-dependent insulin, this increases the production of those. So that, that helps your body to absorb more glu glucose. Um, this can cause nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. And then one thing that, I, and I don't, again, I don't know the reason for this, but it can cause pancreatitis. So if you have a patient who has a history of pancreatitis, you don't want to put them on a GLP-1 analog. Um, the next class of drugs is the DPP-4 inhibitors. All of these drugs contain uh, GLIP in them, so they're all the, the GLIP drugs. And what uh, DPP-4 inhibitors do is they block DPP-4, which blocks GLP-1. So when you give someone a DPP-4 inhibitor, increases the function of GLP-1 because now it's not being blocked. Um, and so then the way that it works is exactly the way that a GLP-1 analog works. Uh, but what this can do is it can give you increased respiratory and urinary infections, and it's a weight neutral drug, so it won't cause them to lose or gain weight. Um, so that's another option, especially in your patients that have like pancreatitis history. Um, you can give them this and it'll do the same thing. Uh, the last drug that we'll talk about is an amylin analog, and the name is pramlinide. So you can remember it pretty easily because uh, the A-M-L-I-N are found in both the name of the drug and what it is. Um, and so the amylin analog, amylin is an enzyme that's released by the pancreas. And so this analog uh, basically acts like extra amylin in the body, which decreases glucagon, glucagon release, and it decreases gastric emptying. So similar to that uh, GLP-1 analog. Um, this can cause hypoglycemia and nausea. Um, so again, same conversation about looking for low blood sugars and having rescue therapy available. So that's how we treat diabetes type 2. Um, there's other ways that we can do that as well, but let's move on to the next topic. Um, I still have just a few more slides, not too much longer. Uh, so you have a patient who's a 17-year-old female, comes into the ER with altered mental status. Her history is unattainable by her, but her mom is there, and she tells you that recently she's been having some weight loss, She's been very thirsty, has been urinating more than usual. Um, the mom states that the patient is otherwise healthy, has no medical problems and no significant past medical history and doesn't take any daily medications. So what is our most likely diagnosis for this patient? Irene, you wanna say something? There are a couple of answers in the chat for C. Yep. Good. So here's all the things that you want to see uh, to highlight. So she's young, um, she's altered, she's losing weight, she's thirsty, she's peeing a lot. Um, and so these are all things that should trigger in your mind uh, type 1 diabetes. This would be a case of acute DKA. 
Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, diabetes mellitus 1 is an autoimmune T cell mediated destruction of your pancreatic beta islet cells, which are the cells that make and secrete insulin. Um, so if you destroy all of these cells, then your body is now unable to make insulin at all. So you can't make any insulin. Um, this process takes a while. Um, you know, sometimes people can have it earlier than others. There's genetic factors at play. Um, but the destruction of these cells make it to where you can't make any insulin. So eventually you reach a point where you have none, and then it usually presents in DKA like this patient did. You'll usually see this in patients under 30, but I have seen it in older patients too. So um, just know that it can happen at any time, um, but most likely they'll be young like the scroll was. So DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is a medical emergency that a type one can go due to a total lack of insulin. Um, I just wanna mention this is again, not for your board exam, but just for life. Uh, type two diabetics can also go into DKA if their disease has progressed so far that they stop making insulin. Your insulin insensitivity, insensitivity can actually get bad enough that your body just stops making insulin because it knows that it's not doing anything. Um, so type twos can go into DKA, but just for boards, DKA is only a type one diagnosis. So just keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, so insulin allows us to use glucose, as you know. So if we don't have that, we can't use glucose at all. And if our body can't use glucose to produce energy, it reverts to something called ketogenesis. So this is a breakdown of fatty acids. Um, and then it uses those uh, acetyl-CoA, which is the breakdown product of that to drive uh, ATP production. Um, so when you break down a bunch of fatty acids, your body makes excess keto ketone bodies. So there's a couple of different ones, but uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate is the most abundant um, in DKA. And then acetoacetate is uh, the next most common. And then some others as well. Um, and ketone bodies are acidic. And so that's where the acidosis comes from is because the ketone bodies are acids. So beta-hydroxybutyric acid or uh, acetoacetic acid. Um, so that's the problem. Insulin also inhibits an enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase. And this uh, enzyme is what causes ketogenesis. So if you don't have any insulin, then the hormone-sensitive lipase activity ramps up and then uh, you'll that'll further worsen the breakdown of all these fatty acids and then the production of these keto acids. So a mnemonic for the signs and symptoms of DKA is that DKA is deadly. So it causes delirium and psychosis, small breathing, which is like a rapid shallow breathing and is not a good sign if you see a patient breathing that way. Um, it can cause abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and then it causes dehydration. So those are the four key symptoms of uh, DKA. Um, and then to answer someone's question from earlier, um, you also make uh, excess acetone as a breakdown product from fatty acids. And acetone, um, is, uh, it's, it has a fruity smell to it. So then patients will breathe out the excess acetone and then it smells like fruit. So then you get a fruity smelling breath. So I've actually never seen that in real life, but it's very common to see that on board questions and things like that. Um, but I mean, I've treated DKA dozens of times and I've never smelled the fruity breath before. So, um, but good for boards. When you get labs, you'll see that the patient is hyperglycemic, um, usually significantly elevated above 600 um, is typical. Uh, they'll also be in acidosis. So they'll have elevated um, uh, hydrogen ions and decreased bicarbonate. And they get an anion gap with this. And so uh, it's an anion gap acidosis. So you'll wanna make sure that, uh, that's beyond the scope of this lecture, but anion gap acidosis, there's uh, mnemonics for that, mud piles. Um, so the D for mud piles is diabetic ketoacidosis. So you'll want to know that. Um, it also will have increased serum and urine ketone levels. Um, so those are in the UA and you can get a blood test for that. And then patients will also get a leukocytosis just because their body is in an acidotic state. And so it's a stress reaction and they'll get an elevated white blood cell count. Um, your potassium levels will actually look normal or be elevated on your blood test because insulin drives potassium into your cells. But since there isn't any insulin on board, then the potassium actually leaks out of the cells and gets into the blood. So your intracellular levels of potassium are actually really low. So these people are intracellularly depleted of potassium. Um, but then any of the excess potassium is just gonna get excreted by the urine. Um, so the blood level might look normal, um, but just remember that these people are not normal. They are low in potassium. And so you have to keep that in mind. Treatment for DKA, fluids, fluids, fluids. So this is the first step to treating DKA. You 
have to give your patient IV fluids because they are significantly dehydrated as a result of all of the excess sugar, peeing out all of the excess water. Um, so they have to get fluids first. That's the first thing. Um, and then you have to give your patient IV insulin um, because you're trying to reverse the uh, effects of the, um, of the fatty acid breakdown. Because So we're giving IV insulin not to treat the blood sugar levels. It's important to know that. Um, we're not worried about the blood sugar levels. We're worried about the fatty acid breakdown because that's what's producing the key acids, which is making your patient acidotic. So you're giving IV insulin because that will stop hormone-sensitive lipase and it will stop fatty acid breakdown, which will then stop the production of acid. So that's why we're giving insulin. You want to give them, uh, usually you put them on a drip and then you kind of titrate it. You need to give them IV potassium um, because again, they're potassium depleted. So when you give them a bunch of insulin, you're going to drive whatever potassium is in their blood into their cells. And then now serum, they're going to be really low on potassium and that can cause cardiac arrhythmias. So you want to give them potassium. And then you want to give them IV glucose once their blood sugar levels fall uh, down below 200. Um, you don't need to know that for boards, but uh, that's kind of the algorithm. Um, so as you're giving all this insulin, um, again, you're not treating the glucose levels. You don't care what the blood sugar level is. You're worried about the acidosis. So you're trying to improve that. And so once the glucose levels fall too low, then you just start giving IV glucose while you give the insulin to treat the acidosis. So this is DKA. This is really common. People come in this all the time. I see it all the time. Um, and then just a note on something called hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state or HHS. This is basically the DKA of type two diabetes. And so this will be board relevant. Um, and you'll need to be able to distinguish between the two on boards because you get a question that looks really close. It's either DKA or HHS, but there will be something that distinguishes between the two and you need to know the differences. So the difference with this is that there is still insulin in the person's blood because they can still make it. They're just so insensitive to it that it's not working very well. Um, and so you don't get any ketones with this though, because the insulin that the patient does have is preventing the fatty acid breakdown. So there's no ketones. Um, your serum osmolality is elevated because of all the extra glucose that's circulating. Um, and then you'll have blood sugars as well. So this disease is named really easily. It's elevated osmolality and elevated blood sugar. So hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, pretty easy to keep that straight. Uh, their, pHs will be, their pH will be normal. Um, they will not be acidotic because there's no keto acids that are being produced because fatty acids are not being broken down. Um, and so those are the big distinguishers. You'll see no ketones, normal pH. They won't be acidotic. Uh, but the treatment is basically the same. Fluids, fluids, fluids. Again, they're dehydrated. You got to give them fluids. Um, and then you give them IV insulin and IV uh, potassium and then IV glucose if you need it, but usually you won't need it with these patients because the, they are making their own insulin anyway, and so they correct a little easier. So you don't usually get hypoglycemic with these patients, but if they're in a bad enough state, you might. And this can progress to a coma, so this is uh, something that you want to catch and treat quickly um, before that happens. And that's from swelling, actually, of the brain from the um, extra fluid, uh, from the sugar. So, and then they keep um, in mind. That's a question. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's coming next, but which fluid should be given? So we, it actually doesn't matter. Um, technically, any crystalloid solution is fine. So you can use normal saline um, or you can use uh, lactated ringers. Uh, the data actually suggests that lactated ringers is better um, and there's better outcomes when you use lactated ringers. Um, or LR. And so I use LR based on that, but for boards, um, use normal saline, uh, the 0.9%. You don't want to use um, like hypernatremic solution um, or anything like that, but, um, or, and you wouldn't want to use. Uh, and, and also one thing that we, we do also, this is again, outside the scope of boards, but if you're worried about their blood sugar levels while you have them on the insulin drip, then you can actually use a D5 with half normal saline solution. So I've done that before too. Um, to give them that extra sugar while I'm treating their, um, their DKA. Uh, but anyway, LR has the best data though for data. So good question. Okay, I think this is my last slide. Um, so this is just treatment for type 1 diabetes. So remember, they don't have insulin. So the treatment is that you give them insulin. Um, so there's a couple of different kinds of insulin and you need to know um, all of these. So make sure you commit these to memory for your board's exam. Uh, but there's rapid acting. So this has a one hour peak. Um, and those are Lispro, Aspart, and Glulysine. 
Um, so the way that you can remember this is Lispro, Aspart, and Glulysine it starts with L, A, and G. So uh, that spells the word lag. And so the rapid acting has no lag. There's no lag, it just happens right away. Um, so that's how I remember that. Um, this is the type of insulin that you'll give your patients uh, for correction after they eat a meal if their blood sugar spikes. Um, and so this is the rapid acting. Then you have a short acting insulin. Um, it has a two to three hour peak and that's just regular insulin. So that's the name it's just called regular insulin. Um, and this is a type of insulin that you can give your patients uh, with meal times as a scheduled amount. So if they're carb counting, then this is the type of insulin that they'll use with that. So, you know, for every 15 grams of carbohydrates that a patient's going to eat, they'll use one unit of regular insulin with their meal. So they count up the number of carbs for their meal, and then they give themselves uh, that many units of regular insulin before they even start eating. And so that's kind of the mealtime dose that we use. Uh, intermediate acting has a four to 10 hour peak. Uh, this is called NPH. That's the type of insulin that you use for that. This kind of insulin it has to be dosed out uh, four times a day. So patients are giving themselves quite a bit more insulin throughout the day, and it's usually a mix. Uh, it's got some regular insulin and then some long-acting insulin, and it's a, it's a blend of those two things uh, to give you that. It's not very, um, it's not the best choice in terms of convenience because the patient then has to stick themselves four times a day, uh, but it's really cheap. And so uh, patients that don't have insurance or that have uh, community insurance and can't afford uh, anything else, this is an option for them. And then the last, uh, the long acting class. So these don't have a peak, uh, they just plateau and then steadily kind of come down. Uh, they usually give you, it says 24 hours, but it's really more like 18 to 20 hours uh, of action. Um, so these are the once daily insulin injections called Detimer or Glargine. Um, so these are the types of insulin that you'll have your patient just use a set number of units every day at the same time every day. And it kind of gives you a basal insulin level um, in their blood. So that's how you treat type 1. Um, if your patient is a type 2 diabetic and they're very terribly controlled, um, which is a lot of my patients, then you might have to end up putting them on insulin too. So it's not only for type 1s, um, but it is obviously the treatment of choice for type 1s because their problem is that they don't have insulin. Okay, that was uh, lengthy. Um, I hope that was helpful. Does anyone have any questions about diabetes or really endocrine for boards in general? So uh, there's a question. Uh, how do you know when a patient is out of DKA? Oh, when they come out of DKA? That's a really good question. Um, so uh, the DKA is gonna cause that anion gap acidosis that we talked about. Um, so again, something that you wanna make sure you know, but basically the anion gap is the sodium minus the chloride minus the bicarbonate. And that number should be 12 or less. Um, so when someone's in DKA, that number is gonna be greater than 12. So I've seen 34 once, I think that's the highest I've ever seen. Um, but like 20 is pretty common. And so what you do is you treat and then you recheck the BMP, which gives you the electrolytes. You recheck that blood test every uh, hour or every two hours. Um, and then once the gap closes, then you can turn off the insulin drip um, and then you can stop giving potassium, stop giving the glucose, um, and then you recheck it again. And if their gap remains closed, then you're out of DKA and then you can kind of just switch back to a normal insulin regimen. Um, but yeah, so you're, you're looking for the gap to close because that means the acidosis has resolved. So a lot of times people will recheck urine and then be looking for ketones, um, but it doesn't matter if the patient has ketones or not, you're worried about the acidosis. So you have to make sure that the anion gap is closed. So that's the marker for when you know you're out of DK. That's a great question. Okay. Uh, this is not a question about today. And Sean, I mean, uh, if you have some time in the future, you can come back for round two. I mean, I mean, this was really great. And there's a question. Could you mention effects of iodine, iodine on thyroid hormone production, specifically oh. radioactive iodine? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So iodine is um, required for T4 uh, synthesis in the thyroid gland. Um, and so a patient has to have um, iodine in order to make uh, T4. Um, so if a patient doesn't have um, enough iodine, which is common in uh, some landlocked areas because iodine is found naturally like in, in seafood because um, it's in uh, like the salt water.
then they can they won't be able to make T4 and they become functionally hypothyroid and they can get a goiter because since the thyroid's not able to make its uh, make the T4, it swells and it gets bigger. And so that's kind of that process. In terms of radioactive iodine, um, that's a like a treatment that we use for someone who is uh, hyperthyroid. Um, and so when someone's thyroid gland is uh, going out of control, we can give radioactive iodine because the thyroid takes up the iodine in order to make the T4, but then we bind radio isotopes to it. Um, and then that causes radioactive destruction of the thyroid. And so you, you destroy those uh, cells of the thyroid that are producing um, the extra T4. Um, did that answer the question? Right. Yeah, and also it's used for patients with uh, thyroid cancer after surgery because, you know, they may not be able to get out all the thyroid tissue. So uh, when 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 the patients come back, they get this thyroid scan, and I, I can in future I can include this. Um, from a radiology point of view, what we do, but then yeah. uh, once you see the uptake in the body, or if you have no metastatic disease with thyroid cancer, right, it's going to be taking up thyroid and showing up. So as long as your tracer is going, you know, like Sean said, is going to be sucked up by either a lymph node with metastatic disease or in the thyroid bed to make sure that you've destroyed all the cancer, then you give the radioactive um, uh, iodine. Okay. Um, well, if there are no more questions, could we say thank you to Sean? And yes, so radioactive uh, iodine has a likely side effect of swinging the patient to hypothyroidism. So yes, and then now you'd have to treat the patient as if they were hypothyroid and replace their hormones. Mm -hmm. um, one person I, I kept the message up is Anthony, Anthony Ocheng, uh, who actually lives in Capsoya. Yeah. So to make sure you get his contact. Uh, and so there are many thank yous and, uh, you know, lots of thank yous. I think you can see the chat now. <laughs> yeah, I can see uh, it. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think this is, was a fantastic lecture. Hopefully, uh, Sean will have some time available. I actually got a, got a good refresher of DKA. It's been a while. And also the new diabetic medications. Um, you know, so hopefully once we know his availability, we can have him back again uh, to maybe uh, talk on adrenal endocrine, endocrinology and uh, maybe thyroid. And so... Um, if there are no more questions next week, it's going to be yours truly, not Sean, not Walter, but myself, back with Venus stuff. Okay. So be ready. Read a little bit about endocrinology, uh, not endocrinology, for sure. I'll be misleading you if I talk about that. Uh, you know, the vein stuff, DVT, PE, uh, portal hypertension. So, um, I'll be going through the blood supply back to the heart. And uh, if I'm motivated, I'll talk about fetal blood supply and we can, you know, just sort of wrap up. Um, and we still haven't done like the lower extremities, but um, we will go back there. There's one question, was some metformin taken off the market? There's actually a, right now, um, a call back for some metformin currently in the market. Yeah. Um, oh, I know someone I, who who got a call from the pharmacy for this right now. Interesting. I had not heard that. Um, mm -hmm. No, I I actually just prescribed metformin like two days ago. So yeah, I think it's a batch. <laughs> that the metformin. Oh, yeah, okay. not that the metformin. Metformin is a very very helpful drug. So I think it's just a batch. Okay, and then um, we have I made the playlist. Thanks uh, to amazing music again from Anthony. So hopefully we'll get some suggestions and uh, have a nice journey. And okay. thank you for joining. Thank and you it so looks like on the chat, people are wanting me to talk about adrenal endocrinology next time. So I am very happy to do that. Um, yeah. So we'll, yeah. we'll figure that out. Adrenal is really difficult. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll go through it. It might take two, but we'll, uh, we'll get through it. So.
Awesome. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for having me, guys. It was great to meet all of you. Um, okay. We'll see you next time. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Oh, one more thing. Yeah. Victor, thank you so much. He keeps everyone on time. I mean, uh, I really appreciate you with the outreach that you're doing. So thank you so much, Victor. Okay, bye. Bye, thank you guys. Thank you.